to see so many of you tuning in for tonight Bible study and uh, the topic we are chose we have chosen for tonight is uh, on prayer and actually this is in line with our NECF uh, call for fasting and praying so there's a great emphasis on praying uh, together so tonight I thought it's important for us to uh, be reminded okay uh, I I don't think we will learn some much more new things than what we already know, but uh, more of reminding uh, the salient point of prayer so that our prayer can be effective before God and that our prayer can be answered by God as we approach Him. All right? So <clears throat> we are going to look at this topic of uh, how to pray effectively like Nehemiah. Uh, you might ask, why Nehemiah? Uh, it's because we just finished the book of Nehemiah. So we want to <clears throat> pick up some points from there and see uh, how he has been able to call upon God and pray effectively that God answers his prayer. So we want to learn from there. All right? So basically, we ask the question, what are the elements in Nehemiah's effective prayer. What, what was his uh, ingredient, so to say, that he uh, approached God with in terms of his prayer to God and how powerful his prayer is? So we want to just look at this and to discover this element. We want to look as, at his model of prayer. Okay? And uh, tonight, I hope that... Uh, more of you can uh, also uh, share. We will break away from our structured kind of Bible study uh, way and uh, we have a more interactive, right? So please be prepared to share your thoughts as we go along. Is that all right? Okay. Okay, well, let's look at Nehemiah's model of prayer or prayer model, okay? Nehemiah was a man of constant prayer, as can be seen in the 14 recorded prayers in the book of Nehemiah. In fact, one of his one of his prayers is supposed to be the longest prayer ever recorded. All right? So he's truly a man of prayer. And before he sets out on the project, remember his project is to build the, the wall of the city of Jerusalem. Before he set out on his project, he prayed. And when he approached the king for permission, he also prayed. And when he was in trouble, he prayed. And finally, he ended his book with a prayer. Okay? This is a man of prayer. Now, studying the prayers in the book of Nehemiah uh, can help us pray better and more effectively. And these prayers, actually, if you, as we read about it, these are amazing prayers and can become a model for us to personalize and cry out to God as we go about the work set before us. Nehemiah was impressed, was burdened by a certain project that God has dropped into his heart. So tonight, even as we go through this uh, time of learning from his uh, prayer model, uh, we also bear in mind what God wants us to do and that we got to come before God to pray for the, that anointing, the, the, the guidance, the wisdom to carry out the project that God lays in our heart. Okay? And uh, I want to thank God uh, for another opportunity to close the book of Nehemiah properly. Because the last session I had three weeks ago, uh, we were quite focused on the various issues in chapter 13 that I didn't have much time to close the last word, the last word of prayer. So thank God I have another opportunity to look at it and uh, uh, we can learn much more from there. All right? So, we are looking at the last words of the chapter, chapter 13, 
which is also the last words of the book of Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 31. I also made provision for contributions of wood at designated times and for the first fruits. Remember me with favor, my God. Right? Remember me with favor, my God. Actually, this seems like a very unusual prayer request, right? In fact, actually, seven times Nehemiah prayed to God to remember something, all right? And out of these seven times, Nehemiah asked God, asked God four times to remember his deeds. It, it's a bit strange because uh, this Nehemiah is coming before God and kind of like, Asking God to remember things. A God who never forgets anything. Right? But let's try to understand why he stressed on this, uh, uh, this verse itself. Remember me with favor, my God. Okay? So, uh, as we look at this verse, can, can, can I ask you all to just think about it? Remember me with, this, with favor, my God. This verse itself. What thoughts come to your mind? You know, why would Nehemiah pray in such a way? You know, asking God to remember him with favor. Can you share some thoughts here? Anyone? Is he worried that uh, God may forget all the all the things that he has done? He's worried, huh? <laughs> okay. All right. Anyone else? Remember me with favor, my God, Nehemiah says to God. Persistency of uh, Nehemiah. Persistency. Sorry, did you say persistency, Brother Yap? Yeah. Oh. How does that tie in with this verse, persistency? Oh, can you explain your thoughts? Like uh, your wife keep on reminding you something, right? <laughs> Okay. Uh, oh. Remember me with favor. <laughs> Remember me with favor. No. If uh, I, I, I would for, for me, for me, for me, Peter, the first time when I read this uh word, Remember me with favor, my God. If I will not un, will not know Nehemiah personality uh throughout the book of Nehemiah, I may find that he is someone that is very insecure. Mm. That he wants God to keep remembering him. Mm. Which indeed is very unusual. Right. Because I think God remember everyone. You don't have to tell him that. Mm. Because God, God only look at what you do in your mind, what is in your mind. So that's my, my, my thought when I first read it. Yes. Very good. Very good sharing. Very I, great. Thought, um, <clears throat> I thought um, Nehemiah comes from um, a sense of hum humility. A sense of humility. Lord, um, please, uh, you know, uh, remember me uh, favorably. Remember me favorably. I'm only just a little me, just a little me, all right? I'm only just Nehemiah, you know? So when you, you know, please remember me favorably. So it was from a humble heart. It was mm. from a sense of humility. Mm. Yes, very good. Anybody else? Remember me with favor, my God. Maybe we can, we can understand it a bit more if you look at the word favor. What is the meaning of the word favor? Favor. What does it mean? Any English teacher here? Blessings. Blessing? Grace. grace. Sorry? Grace. Did somebody grace. say grace? Yeah. Okay. Actually, if you look at the dictionary, the word is uh, approval, support or liking for someone or something. 
So basically, he's saying to God, remember me with approval, my God. Okay? So he's coming before God to, to ask God, hey, God, you know, do you approve of what I've done? Remember me. Give me your approval. That kind of uh, attitude, you know. Uh, in a very, maybe a very intimate way, he comes before God. Or a candid way, you know. He's, he might be saying that, God, I have done this for you, you know. In obedience to your word that you have instructed me to carry out this project. Uh, are you happy? You know, do you approve? You know, and, and you know, sometimes like children, uh, when they come before the, their parents or the father and say, no, remember what I've done for you, so seeking approval from the father. It's the like, same way, I think <clears throat> Nehemiah approached God in that way. You know, to, to just want to hear God's approval upon him. You know, uh, so uh, I think that's why he, he asked God to remember him. Okay, and uh, so we, we have to be faithful in every good work like Nehemiah and we may make a confident appeal to God for recognition, remembrance, recompense. Okay, so that as we do the job that God wants us to do and we are satisfied and we know that we have completed, we can come before him and say, God, how, how do you feel about it? Can you remember all that I've done? You know, uh, it, it's not like bragging, but he's just turning to God for the kind of uh, uh, nodding, uh, the kind of approval. You know, so basically, what he's saying to us is, we do not look anxiously about us for man's smile, but to but to but do look earnestly above us for Christ's approval and beyond for his reward. Okay? So don't look, look, don't look for approval from men, but most important, get the approval from God. This is uh, how Nehemiah um, uh, uh, feeling, I think. Huh? How is his feeling? So question is, how did Nehemiah want to be remembered by God? In Nehemiah chapter 4, 5 verse 19, he prayed, Remember with me with favor, O oh my God. And the last words again in 31, Remember me with favor, my God. Okay? So I just want to uh, emphasize on that. So um, now before I go into the, the actual prayer model of uh, Nehemiah, I want to highlight a uh, uh, another verse that is uh, very powerful to me uh, in terms of uh, uh, getting uh, answers for our prayer. Okay, uh, and this verse is found in James chapter five, which I think many of us are very familiar. Chapter five, verse sixteen of James says, "Therefore, confess your sins to each other." And pray for others so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Okay, uh, in, that is in NIV. In the New King James Version, it says the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Okay, so I want to. Uh, just highlight this verse here because I feel this is a very important verse for us to look at. Okay. Now, uh, again, I'd like you all to just look at this verse a little bit uh, more. And again, let's share some thoughts here. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man Availed much in King James Version. I uh, like the way it's phrased. So, uh, what comes to your mind when you see this verse, this powerful verse regarding prayer? Uh, take, take a few moments to think about it and then perhaps you can share and uh, 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 maybe we can learn from one another. 
Just a few minutes for you to think through. The effective, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availed much. What thoughts come to your mind? What impression do you get for each of those words that are stated there? If you have a pen or pencil, you just jot down, you know, each words, what does it say to you? What are the key words that impress upon you talking about prayer? Anyone? Or maybe ask, what do you think are the key words in this verse itself? See, uh, effective, effectual. Yes. Fervent, uh, prayer, righteous. Avail much. Every almost everyone is uh, significant. Every word. Huh? <laughs> yeah. My first thought is when I look at effectual, for example, uh, yeah, it, it it produces results. Yes. Yeah. It's effective. It 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 uh, produces the kind of outcome that we desire. Yeah. So that's my first thought. Yeah. <clears throat> Pat, any ideas, any thoughts here? <laughs> I think all the words uh, are all the words are very strong. Uh, what strikes me is a righteous man. Uh. Okay. All right. A righteous person. Uh, our okay. prayer will be effective and powerful if we are righteous. Okay. Very good point. Elvis, want to say some thoughts here, Elvis? No? <laughs> okay. What, what, I, what I look at all these uh, words, uh, effectual, fervent, righteous, these are the action that God pleases God. So yes. indirectly, if you do something that pleases God, your mm -hmm. prayer, your unceasing prayer, the fervent prayer, will be very effective. Mm. Yes. One more response. How about Brother Franco? Sorry, I was eating my chocolate just now. <laughs> um, I think I think all these words also um, come from the heart because it, it affects the whole the whole part of your your body. As in, but uh, the inner side of yourself is the heart. That it's um, fervorness um, before God, before God. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So, yeah, every word is important in this verse here. And this is a very powerful verse because it tells us how to get answers to our prayer. Am I right? Okay. So maybe we just take a few moments to look at each word. Huh? The effectual, right? What does it mean? Fervent, okay? And as Pat said, the righteous man. And then even the last uh, two words, availed much. Each word has a, a very significant meaning here. Uh, I, I found a fun way actually to, to try to find the translation of each words, you know. So what I did was uh, I looked at all the different versions and see what words they use in place of these uh, verses uh, here, okay. So allow me to just go through quickly. In New International Version, it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective, right? Uh, the next version says that the earnest prayer, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces much results, or produces wonderful results. And 
English Standard Version say it has great power as it is working, meaning that it works, right? Okay, the prayer of a righteous person, it works. It has great power because it works. Berean study says that it has great power to prevail. New American Standard says the effective prayer, okay, effective, same as the effectual, uh, can accomplish much. The Christian Standard Bible says it's very powerful in its effect. Then the contemporary English says that is uh, the prayer of an innocent man uh, in place of the righteous person. Uh, the innocent man, a person, is powerful. The prayer is powerful and it can help a lot. Okay, very simple English. <laughs> okay. And the good news translation is the prayer of a good person, good person, uh, in place of the righteous person is a good person has powerful effect. Holman Christian Standard Bible says the urgent request, uh, the urgent in place of fervent or effectual, is very powerful in its effect. Uh, the International Standard Version says that it is powerful and effective. New Heart English says powerfully effective. Aramic says that for the power of the prayer which is which a righteous man a person prays is great and another translation says that prayer offered by those who have god's approval okay god's approval are effective okay new american standard again 1977 okay <laughs> the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. American Standard Version again, the supplication of a righteous man availed much in his working. Uh, another version said, the, for the continual prayer of a just man availed much. With mouth said, the heartfelt supplication of a righteous man asserts a mighty influence. And World English Bible, Last one that we have here is the insistent prayer of a righteous person is powerfully effective. I hope you can try to remember some of these words, which I will refer to again afterwards. So basically, uh, looking at the first words here, the effective, the word effective, what does it mean? It means is successful in producing a desired or intended result. That means it can achieve uh, the result that you are seeking for. So in terms of prayer, that means you get your prayer answered, right? So is the, the word effective is actually a, a, a method, a way to do things, right? Effective. So it's meaning that it's the correct way of praying that will bring result. The effective prayer is a correct way to bring results. Okay, so that's effective. The next verse is uh, fervent. Can you remember some of the words we read just now? Fervent. Okay, uh, the, the English definition means uh, having or displaying a passionate intensity a passionate intensity right and from the versions that we read from the different uh, the bible versions uh, uh, the words came out as uh, intense okay intense that means the intense prayer of a righteous man uh, can bring results the earnest prayer the passionate prayer the heart, heartfelt prayer and the urgent prayer, okay? These are the words that was used in the different translation. And also, continual prayer. That means it's continuous, right? Persistent prayer. Sincere prayer. And it's also uh, serious prayer, okay? The serious prayer. Uh, it reminds me of the famous Bua Chukang. Do you, do you, some of us may not know him. 
um, those on uh, at my age level would know who is Bua Chu Kang from Singapore. He always say, don't play, play, eh? right? So don't play, play, but we must pray, pray, okay? All right? That is fervent prayer. Be serious about it, okay? Then the next verse is uh, righteous man. Now, what does the word righteous man means? Pat was saying that, you know, that the verse is important. So what does it mean, a righteous person, a righteous man? The, the English meaning of the word righteous means morally right or justifiable, okay? But from the different translation we read, we got, we got some words like uh, good, the good man, uh, the innocent man, you remember, uh, the man with God's approval, okay? God's approved man. Uh, the just man, and also the holy man, okay? So the effective fervent prayer of a good man, innocent man, God's approved man, just man, uh, and holy man will avail much. That means it will bring about the result that we are seeking for. Now, as you look at again the word righteous man, there is good news and bad news I'd like to bring to you. Which one would you have first? Usually people say bad news, okay? So I go to the bad news first. The bad news is there is none righteous among us, right? The Bible says, who among us is righteous? In Romans chapter 3, verse 10, huh? as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one in the NIV version. So when we read this verse, we, we will feel discouraged, right? Uh, we will feel that we are disqualified to make that prayer because we are not righteous. So how then can we meet this condition in James chapter 5, verse 16 to, to achieve results in our prayer? How do we, can we meet this condition, being a righteous person, whereas the Bible tells us there's none righteous, no one is righteous before God. Anyone? Is the answer Jesus? Huh? Is the answer Jesus? Uh, in a way, yes. In a way, yes. How then do, do we meet this condition? How to meet this condition of being righteous? Jesus, righteous, what do you mean by that? Righteousness is not from us. It's not from what? How good we are, what we did. The righteousness is from Christ Himself. God gave us the righteousness. Mm -hmm. So we can approach Him as a righteous person. Yes. Very good. Anybody else? It is a kind of a theological issue here. <laughs> Who can be righteous? We are made righteous through the perfect blood of Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. Any response from you, Brother Terence? <laughs> uh, as my youth like to say, I follow, I agree with Brian and Patricia. <laughs> okay, can you repeat what they say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, we are not righteous, and then it is uh, we actually depend on the righteousness of Jesus to go to the throne of God above, and then uh, we are cleansed by the righteousness of the blood of Christ uh, because all our penalty, all our sin, and everything was hung on the cross, and uh, Christ cleanses us. And uh, and uh, is that correct, teacher? <laughs> okay, so the bad news was given. Now I give you the good news. All right. Can I, can, I, can I say something? Sure, sure. The righteous man is Jesus. That's why we always pray. We end up, we pray this, you know, in Jesus' name. Okay. That's why then we can get the prayer we want. We, we pray through Jesus always, not yes. through ourselves. Yes, that's true. Okay. But if you look at the verse carefully, it says, the effective, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man. Of a righteous man. So we have to ask ourselves, do we meet that condition of being righteous before God? 
you see? Uh, if you look at self, you know, no, I don't think any one of us can say I am, I'm righteous by myself. True or not? Okay. So the good news is, uh, this is a, quite a, 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 a how to say, a theological uh, term here. Uh, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ. Like somebody say just now, huh? in Christ's name, through Christ, right? Because we are made righteous by Him, okay? But there is a way for us to meet this condition because it says in Romans chapter 2, verse 12 to 13, for all, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is, those, it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. So you want to be righteous, you obey the word, the law. Okay? And another verse says in Romans chapter 5, verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also, also by one man's, dis, uh, one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. We are made righteous through one man's obedience. And who is that? None other than our Lord Jesus. Amen? And Romans chapter 4, verse 24. But also for us to whom God will Credit righteousness. Huh? God gives us the credit for righteousness. Huh? For us who believe in Him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. So as long as we believe in Jesus, right, then we will get that righteousness credited to us. Okay. So the question now is then, how then can man be righteous before God? The answer is by faith alone. Amen. We come to God by faith, claim the righteousness of Christ through us and that we can stand before God worthy of His calling upon us and worthy to pray and believe and claim the answers uh, for our prayers. Amen. So we qualify to be considered as a righteous man or woman because we have believed in Jesus. All right? So that's just one part. Uh, there is also another part is uh, talking about confessions of sin to be righteous, which I will talk about later on when I look into the uh, uh, elements of uh, Nehemiah's prayer in chapter 1. Huh? Okay? So we move on to the next the last two words okay the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much what does it mean it means to produce or result as a benefit or advantage it means that answer can be obtained right when the effective and the fervent prayer of a righteous man is made it will achieve and uh, from the different versions, we read those words like great power and produces wonderful results. Uh, great power as it is working, it accomplish much, and it's powerful and it can help a lot. And it's powerful effect, and it's powerfully effective, and it asserts a mighty influence. So, if you meet these three conditions, right, effective fervent prayer of a righteous man, he will get the results. That means if we meet these three conditions, our prayers will be answered by God. Amen? So these are the three elements that will bring result in prayer. Now, are these three elements contained in Nehemiah's model prayer? Let's look at it, okay? And from this part onwards, it's actually uh, something that I have covered in the first chapter of Nehemiah. So this is like a revision for those of you who are, uh, have attended it. Uh, you can do uh, check your, your memory and see whether you can remember those points. For those of you, you who are 
here for the first time for this class, this is something that you can pick up, all right? We read from Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 5, okay? And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. So the first element here we see in Nehemiah's prayer is in this verse here. Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God. The first element in his prayer is he acknowledged the greatness of God in verse 5. Okay? He acknowledges how great God is. Okay? It's actually a form of uh, praise and worship. So sometimes when we come before God in prayer, it's good to start by, by a praise, by a word of praise and a worship. Okay? And, and to give recognition to God's sovereignty in our life, that God is in control. He is indeed a great God, an awesome God, right? And it's important we look at God that way as we approach Him in prayer, that we see Him uh, in His greatness, then we see our problems in the relative smallness. Okay? That's why we must get things in the right perspective. Okay, to see the big God, the problem becomes small. Amen. So we must focus on God and His awesomeness and His greatness. And this is a very similar expression by the by Daniel in the book of Daniel, verse uh, chapter nine, verse four. Right. He also prayed a similar way, isn't it? Look, look at this. I pray to the Lord my God and confess, Lord. The great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Amen. <clears throat> he also prayed a similar way, you know, that they all know that when you come into the presence of God, you first acknowledge him of his greatness, his awesomeness, his might, my majestic, uh, his almightiness. All right. So we, we, we have a right focus before we even utter, utter our prayer. Okay? And this is also very similar to Jesus' uh, prayer when he, teach, when he taught the prayer, uh, disciples how to pray. You remember in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13, the Lord's Prayer. You remember the first verse? Can we all say that? Testing anybody. <laughs> how does the Lord's Prayer start? Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. Art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? So Jesus is saying the same thing right here. You know, even Jesus, you know, said we must acknowledge God first. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Okay? So um, we must have that kind of uh, um, attitude uh, of a precision coming into the presence of God. So we acknowledge God first. That's the first point here. Okay. And the second point is found in the uh, same verse. You who keep your covenant and your mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. So what is the second element here? He remembers that God keeps his promises. He remembers that God keeps his promises. Okay? It's like affirming his faith in the God who keeps his promises. Nehemiah come into the presence of God knowing that he is praying to a God who will always keep his promise. Right? He will never break his promise as he's a God who keeps promises. Okay? He's approaching God on the basis of his faith and trust in God that God never fails in keeping His promise. It's like saying to God, Lord, I'm calling upon you because I know I can trust you in your unfailing love and that you will keep your promise, that you will answer my prayer. So he remembers that God keeps His promise. That's the second element in God, uh, Nehemiah's prayer. And the third one is down the verse a bit. I pray before you now, 
day and night. Day and night. So the third element we can see here is he's expressing unceasing prayer. Verse 6, day and night. And you can see here how urgent and serious his prayer was. He come before God day and night, relentless, calling upon God. Just as stated in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 7, say, pray without ceasing. If it's something that you're facing is such a big issue for you, such a big obstacle, you know, such a big difficulty, you need to come before God and pray without ceasing. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 says, Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you again. Right? Okay. And therefore, uh, another verse that tells about the persistency and the fervent prayer that we must have is in, uh, in the New Testament, the parable of the persistent widow. Verse 18, huh? all right? It says here, um, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. All right? Always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in the town who kept coming to him with a plea. Grant me justice against my adversary. Verse 4, for some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge say, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen one who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they will get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? All right. So this is telling about the, the uh, perseverance, the persistency, uh, the coming to God uh, day and night in crying out to God. And that's what Nehemiah did. All right. If you read, go back to, um, to chapter 1, uh, you read before. He was praying for a certain thing uh, uh, to cry out to God for how long? Do you remember? Brian, do you remember for how long? Four months. months. Four months. Okay. So very persistent, consistent prayer by uh, Nehemiah. Okay. And he was praying with fervency. Okay. That means the first the condition in James chapter 5, verse 16, right? And the next one is uh, found in later part of verse 6. It says that, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you, both my father's house and I have sinned. Okay, so what is the fourth element? Confesses his sin, right? Confession of sin. Okay, he knew, Nehemiah knew that he has to confess his sins before he even presents his, his request before God. He knows that God will not grant the prayer of a sinful man, okay, or an unrighteous man, as we can put it. Huh? In verse uh, six, uh, 18 of Psalm 66, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear my prayer. Okay? And John chapter 9, verse 31. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does His will. Note it. He only listens to godly person who does His will, who obeys His word. Alright? So, we must take note that you cannot come before God and ask for answered prayers if you have sinned in your heart. 
you must deal with the sins. You must purify yourself. You must confess your sin. That's why confession of sin precedes answered prayer. You want answers to prayer, then you better confess your sin first. Okay, that's why sometimes people say, "How come my prayer are not answered?" Maybe, maybe you did not meet that condition of being、uh, pure before God, you know,、uh, and uh, being righteous before God in that sense. Okay, so to be righteous also to mean to confess your sins so that you be cleansed and be made righteous in the presence of God again. All right. So the next verse. Is found the next next element is found in verse eleven of chapter one. It says here, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this servant and the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. So, what is the element number five? He asked God specifically. God grant me success today. All right, grant me success today by granting me favor in the presence of this man. Okay, very specific. He knows what he wants from God, and he goes straight to the point. All right. So sometimes when we come before God with a prayer need, be very focused and say, God, I need, I need. Your your blessings. I need answers for this specific prayer. So be very specific. Okay. So these are the five elements in Nehemiah's prayer. Okay. He acknowledges God's greatness. He remembers God. Keeps his promise. He expresses unceasing prayer. He confesses his sin, his sins, and he also asks God very specifically. And do you know that this is also found? Uh, verified by the Lord Jesus in His Lord's Prayer, which I touch upon、uh, a little bit, but let's be a little bit matching on that. Okay, these five elements is also found in Jesus' Prayer in Matthew chapter six, verse nine to thirteen. In number one, the God God's greatness, you no, know, is expressed just now as I mentioned. Our God, our Father who art in heaven, and God's promises is in, found in the verse. Your kingdom come and your will be done, okay. And a specific request is: give us this day our daily bread. Confession of sin is what: forgive us our sin, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Verse twelve. And another one is specific request that says: lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from. Evil or from sin. Okay. Now the elements may not be in the same order, but they are the same elements expressed or exhibited. Okay. And the last one is、uh, God's greatness. He ended the prayer, the Lord's prayer, with、uh, God's greatness. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. So he said, the similar kind of、uh, teaching is also、uh, given by the Lord Jesus Himself. So these are the elements we find in Nehemiah. So tonight I end here by asking the question: Can we all be like me, Nehemiah? Can we all be like Nehemiah, a great prayer warrior? And how can we pray like him? We must remember the five. Uh, elements that、uh, we touch on just now, and in in a quick summary, we must pray with fervency. Okay, come before God, cry unto God with passionate cry from our heart. We must be persistent, never give up. Pray until something happen. Okay, push, and also perseverance. Never, never give up. Just keep calling to God, and He will answer us. Okay, so、uh, I just open up here. I got a few more minutes, two or three more minutes. Anyone has a testimony to share?、Uh, as you remember, this uh, this uh, prayer elements、uh, in Nehemiah's prayer.、Uh, can anyone just 
share something along that line? Uh, may I, can I share? Sure. Yes, just I remember one incident. I think, but before I share that that particular incident, I think it's important uh, for us to pray together. It's uh, very important for us. Yeah. Uh, in the model of Nehemiah, Nehemiah pray. Yeah. Uh, it seems like a lot of times alone, but I think for us as a church, it's important for us to adopt this prayer together, right? So that uh, one thing is that when we pray together and God answers it, right? Uh, glory goes to God. Right? It is the prayer of the church, the prayer of the saints coming together and pray. And it's not one person who is more powerful than the other in their prayer. And so, so I, I always enjoy, I always value uh, the church coming together to pray. And uh, Psalms 133 says, how sweet it is that brothers dwell in unity. From there, you know, they, they, God pours out the blessings. When we come together to pray in unity and earnestly, fervently, persistently, or everything that you mentioned about specifically, uh, when you talk about that, uh, it gives me the picture of a, like a laser focus, like a laser or uh, this uh, welding torch, you know, that can that is directed into the area of need. So that was a picture that came to mind when uh, Uncle Peter was sharing just now. So I remember when we there was a one time we prayed for someone who was involved in an accident. Actually, two times. I just remember one time. Yeah, I just mentioned it was a auntie, elderly auntie of uh, uh, one of our church members, and uh, was knocked by a bus. Yeah, and she was in ICU, and the doctors said that there's not much hope for her. Her brain is dislocated, all kinds of things. Yeah, but as we, and, and I remember we gathered around her, the ICU bed, a few people, and we prayed together, and we continued to bring that the need before the Lord. Yeah, as as a church, and the Lord did an amazing thing. He he healed her. Not only he healed her, he restored her sight. He restored her hearing. It's so sharp. And uh, and she she it restored her memory. She can remember phone numbers as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so so that's an amazing thing, you know. This is an elderly lady knocked by a bus, uh, and God is good. God is good. So I, I my encouragement for us is let us continue to meet together. Yes, we can pray alone, but the 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 blessed thing is that God calls us as a body to pray together. So thank you, uh, uh, Uncle Peter, for sharing and teaching us.